All right, so here we are, Great Steel Research Review. Welcome back. Uh, I'm Jonathan Sullivan. I'm the owner of Great Steel Strength and Conditioning in Farmington Hills, Michigan, and the author uh, with Andy Baker of the Barbell Prescription. And I'm joined today by the newest member of our Great Steel Research Review faculty, not faculty, <laughs> uh, Dr. Frederick Barnes. Uh, an orthopedic surgeon, hand surgeon, and a uh, lifter. He's actually one of my online clients. Fred, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I'm a graduate of Cornell University Medical College. I'm a practicing orthopedic surgeon for the last 25 years. Um, former chief of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Lehigh Valley Hospital, Pocono. And uh, I've been in clinical practice for 25 years in general orthopedics and hand surgery. Um, and currently, I'm still in practice, still see patients daily, operate weekly, and uh, lift weights three times a week <laughs> at this point <laughs> and keep it up. So I know you do. I know you do. Uh, and, doing, and doing very well. You have a very good coach. Uh, I know. He's an excellent coach. <laughs> <laughs> so um, are you uh, – are you ready to light this can? You ready to scrub in? Yes, I'm ready to go. All right. So um, the first up today is mine. This is Anderson et al. Real and perceived effects of caffeine on sprint cycling, uh, sprint cycling performance in experienced cyclists. This is Journal of Strength and Conditioning and Research, uh, Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research 2020, quite recent. And um, it's a bit of a contrary data point to a good body of other literature that uh, confirms the inarguable uh, providential goodness of caffeine. And it's more in line with a minority of data that suggests that caffeine doesn't actually do much. Uh, as usual, the truth probably lies somewhere in between. Uh, in any event, these investigators wanted to assess the placebo effect of caffeine in athletic performance. So they took nine gullible bros and one gullible young lady. <laughs> and lied to them. Yes, they uh, a, did. A total of 10 gullible subjects. That's right. You heard that right. <laughs> Huge study of 10 subjects. Um, and before a Wingate trial, a standard assay of anaerobic power, these experienced cyclists were told that they would be receiving a low-dose caffeine, high-dose caffeine, and a placebo over the course of three trials, separated by at least a week. In fact the subjects received either a placebo or decaffeinated coffee as a placebo during two trials or coffee during one trial. Uh, this was a commercial Starbucks product, one of those horrible via pack yeah. things. So no attempt was made to assay the actual caffeine content. The authors just assumed that the they decaf did. had zero and the regular had 280 milligrams per serving. Um, this whole approach to me suggests a crossover design in which the subjects would be compared to themselves in each condition, but that's not what they did here. They just compared aggregate performance in all three conditions, right. which I'm not sure why. Uh, I want to assume that these are smart people. I think they're smart people, but it seems to me that looking at inter-individual differences or a lack of same would have been more revealing. In any case, what did they find? The investigators report that 70% correctly reported that they had received the caffeine, but time to peak power was significantly higher in those who guessed incorrectly that they had received caffeine when they received the placebo. Power drop was higher in those who thought they had consumed caffeine, who thought they had consumed caffeine, when in fact they had also received a placebo. Uh, there were some minor changes in blood lactate across the groups, but the investigators say it wasn't significant. I don't think any of this is significant, but more on that in a moment. The investigators conclude that there may be a placebo effect of caffeine based on these results. Well, sure, there may be. There almost certainly is. But any imputation that there is no physiological effect as well isn't borne out here. And physiological effects of caffeine are well studied and well documented and well characterized. Furthermore, look at the findings. The belief you had caffeine improved time to peak power, which is consistent with the placebo effect, but the belief that you had received caffeine was also associated with more power drop. So 
if you think you're getting the performance enhancing drug, but your form, performance declines, that doesn't sound like a placebo to me. No. Yeah. And all of this is predicated on our confidence in the study, which I'm not sure is warranted. This is a tiny study, which is 10 subjects, including one female and nine men. Right. So there's a lot writing on the absence of differences, but the authors document no power analysis to assure us that there's no type two error here. The only significant differences here are in time to peak power and in power drop. Right. The difference in other performance parameters like peak power and average power are not statistically significant. They're of highly questionable clinical significance. And I think if you just looked at caffeine versus placebo, uh, it would have been a wash or favored ca caffeine over placebo, although we don't have that analysis. And the design seems a bit off to me. Again, this seems like a crossover study would have been more robust helping to correct for the small and uh, probably underpowered nature of the study. And the real killer for me, the groups were not pre-allocated. The subjects were placed into groups based partly on what they had received and partly on what they thought they had received mm. based on their guess of what they had received after the performance trial. And I think that is potentially confounding. So they had bias the bias of their own performance. So what happens to an athlete in the field? They know whether they're drinking coffee or not and whether it's decaf or not before they go to work. So if there's a placebo effect of caffeine, it's based on the prior belief that caffeine has been consumed, not a situation where the athlete doesn't know anything except that he may be getting a placebo. And the athlete's mm. assessment of his own performance during the trial and his own subjective feelings are germane here. So what the investigators really did was to test the effect of a Wingate trial on the athlete's ability to guess whether they had caffeine, not on the placebo effect of caffeine on performance. Yeah, right. So is there a placebo effect of caffeine? Almost certainly as for any drug, but the physiological and performance effect of caffeine have been looked at, the former better than the latter. And while there is certainly a question about how much caffeine helps anaerobic performance, I don't think this paper answers any burning questions of relevance to the coach, the athlete, or the basic scientist. It's sure to be talked about, but uh, I'm not at all sure what the study means. Uh, I'm certainly not sure that it means what the authors think it means. All right. What'd you think, Fred? Well, I kind of I kind of go with you. I think that the placebo effect is really something that you're going to give that, give that medicine, give that uh, drug to the patient, and then let them make this decision. It's, it's, if you're guessing if they had the medicine, it's, it, it does not wash with uh, the way I, I view a placebo effect. And, and I really don't think we can get much out of 10 people without the individual um, particulars, really. Right. So, you know, I don't, I don't think it's, uh, it's really going to answer anything really. I right. Know, so, so. Um, it, you know, it's, it's a, it's, people are sure to point to it. Yeah. See caffeine, it's all placebo effect. I don't think it, I don't think it shows anything of the sort. I'm not sure it shows much of anything at all, except um, the ability of a Wingate trial to affect your guess of whether or not you had caffeine or not. 